Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'm really, um, really, really excited to welcome you here today and, um, and talk about educator wellness. We know this is a really important topic right now. I mean, it's an important topic always, but certainly right now, um, it's, really, it's really great to, to be here with you today, to be able to share with you some, yeah, some tips and advice to improve your own well-being during some really stressful times. Um, before we get started, I wanted to start out with our equity statement at Committee for Children, which is our commitment to recognize, condemn, disrupt, and seek to rectify systemic injustices that create barriers to children's success. Um, and our land acknowledgement is, is that we are, our Committee for Children offices sit on the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, past, present, and specifically the first peoples of Seattle, Washington, the Duwamish tribe. Um, as we honor the Duwamish people and the Duwamish land, it is also important that we consider our place in the past, present, and future history of the indigenous peoples of our region and how we can best support them. So um, wherever you are joining from us, joining us today, I'd love for you to just pause for a minute and think of the first peoples of the land that you are on as we are, are talking. So today we're going to start with a few quick uh, introductions. We're going to talk about why educator wellness. We're going to share with you some self-care strategies, managing stress and emotions, sleep, foods and moods, physical activity, and self-compassion. And then finally, we will wrap up with gratitude. Um, so my name is Amy Walker, and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Committee for Children. I have been at Committee for Children for 18 years, um, and I also have worked as a teacher. And um, I am, have, this past year has been such a profound year for us at Committee for Children, as it has been for all of you. But um, but I have to say, I, I don't think that there's been any time in the 18 years at my time at Committee for Children that I've been more honored to be here um, in the sense that that we know that social emotional learning is so important for kids right now. And um, really, there's a lot of strong feelings going along, going, going around and a lot of anxiety and a lot of trauma um, and a lot of change and a lot of hardships and job loss and people losing family members to COVID. And it's, it's been a really, really intense year. And, and being able to provide teachers with the resources that they need to be able to support their students um, with social emotional skills has been a, quite an honor to all of us at Committee for Children. Um, and so one of the things we're, we're doing is we've done a few of these educator wellness webinars because we haven't forgotten about you. And just because our, our work is really focused on providing the social emotional sports that you need to help kids, we also we also care about teachers a lot. And um, and one of the things we're really we're really excited about is next month we have an SEL program coming out that is for teachers. It's an SEL for adults program um, that's going to be kind of an expansion of Second Step into the to the to the to the to the adults on your campus. And I'll I'll share a little bit more about that later. Um, but I'm really happy that you have taken the time to to come here to learn a few strategies for yourselves because you can't be what you what you are for the kids in your schools, your own kids, your families, your communities, if you aren't taking care of yourselves. And I think one of the things I have known in my many years in education is that teachers are really great when it comes to caring for other people. Um, and you're all not that great about caring for yourselves sometimes, you know, and so, so we hope that at least for the next hour, you put yourselves first. You put yourselves first for the next hour. So, um, well, that's what we're going to be doing, and we invite you to, to share in that. So, um, Jackie, do you want to just say hello and just talk a little bit about your role today? Sure. Thank you, Amy. As Amy mentioned, I'm also on the Education Partnerships team. I work primarily in the Southeast, so my Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, Carolina folks, um, but really, I'm so jazzed about SEL and um, so, so grateful to be on this team. Um, like Amy said, this year has been quite a year, year and a half, seems like five. Um, so I am really excited for this presentation. There's so many good research-based tips in it. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what suggestions you have for Amy and I. I mean, <laughs> we're stressed too. We can use some some good tips from you all too. Yeah, and all the content was... The content in this webinar was actually developed by the folks that, that designed our SEL for Adults program. So that's that's where it's all based on the research um, from that group. So um, for those of you that are not familiar with Committee for Children, we are very proud to say that our programs are reaching over 20 million children right now. Wow, you know, what a what a what a great thing it is that 20 million kids are getting second step. 
Um, and we also do a lot of advocacy work in Washington, D.C. and state capitals around the country. We're working hard in Washington right now to try to really push forth funding for SEL um, for and, and all things, you know, that can support education right now for kids. So um, so what we do is many most of you probably know us by our second step program. And we offer a holistic approach to building supportive communities for every child through social emotional learning. And our second step family of programs supports the whole child by building social emotional competence, addressing bullying, and helping protect children in school with resources that also support adult educators and extend beyond the classroom. So um, second step is a, is a SEL curriculum that goes from preschool up to grade eight. We also have an out of school time version of second step that is for after school programs in elementary and now coming out just in a couple of weeks, SEL for adults, which is a K-12 program for adults of all, um, all teaching all grade levels. So, so why educator wellness? Well, um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, and I think the most important one is because you matter. You know, I think that one of the things we, we also sometimes talk about educator wellness, you know, in the sense of like, well, educator wellness matters because it helps kids. And that's the reason we have schools. And that is also true, but it also matters just in and of itself for you. It's kind of like if we teach SEL to kids, test scores go up. But the reason for teaching SEL is not so that test scores go up. That's one of the benefits of teaching SEL. Um, the reason is is really about the well-being of kids, and educator wellness is about the well-being of you. And fortunately, the better you take care of yourselves, the more that's going to show up in positive ways in your classrooms. So, I am going to show up to share to share with you now a video that we have created that is about um, that is about educator well-being, and it's part of um, something that we made to, for, for the release of our new program. Teachers are always going to be stressed because they want to be the best. Teachers have to do everything. Teachers have to work extra hours. Teachers have to plan, prep, grade. Teaching has always been a stressful job, but right now it's off the charts. You want to know what predicts classroom quality, at least according to research? Teachers' social and emotional well-being, better than their preparation or their experience. As a school, if you don't have a strong social emotional foundation, you'll find lots of cracks. It's the key and the foundation for everything else. If you want a healthy, positive school culture, invest in teachers' well-being. When teachers' emotional and social needs are met, they establish a really positive learning environment for their students. Teachers want to work in an organization that's supportive and growth producing. My staff is my number one priority. I have to make sure they feel successful, and the only reason my school can be great is because I have the teachers that make it great. To be the best school, we have to be intentional. We need to invest in relational trust. We need to help teachers manage their stress. And we need to have teachers know how to work together. When somebody walks into my school, they need to feel this is the best place they've ever entered. They need to feel welcome, love, and connection. If we take care of the grown-ups, they will take care of the students. Yeah, so teaching is demanding, you know. Um, isolation is something that you often don't think of related to teachers because it's such an intensely social job. But in many ways, you're also isolated because you don't have the time that you wish you could have to collaborate with your peers. Um, especially on Zoom, you're not even getting that much feedback from the kids, you know, in the sense of many of their cameras are off a lot of the times, you know, you're not getting, you're not getting the kudos and the compliments and the, and the positive feedback that you deserve and that you, um, you know, that would help you. And also just the, you know, the collaboration and sharing of ideas and, all those things that you could get with your colleagues if you had more time, even when you're in buildings. Um, you know, and also teaching is a huge responsibility. I mean, you've got 25 kids that you're with all day long. You are really the most important figure in a child's social emotional development and in their life in many ways outside of the family unit. So um, it's a huge responsibility. And of course, it's also a huge opportunity, which is why you all are in teaching because, um, 
you know, because you can really impact the lives of people in such a profound way. And also that comes with a responsibility. And unfortunately, also, teachers are really scrutinized. You know, you have scrutiny from your all of your parents and your principal and the media. And, you know, there's just there's just so much pressure on teachers, um, so much pressure than than, you know, than in other jobs. I mean, nobody who's an accountant has 25 families following them around, making sure that they're, <laughs> you know, doing, doing everything just perfectly by their child or, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of pressure. So, and all of it can be so stressful, you know, and it really, um, the stress affects teachers health and job satisfaction a lot. 41% of teachers leave the profession within five years. 46% of teachers report significant stress and burnout. And these, by the way, are statistics that are pre pandemic. So these numbers would be higher. Um, students who are more stressed can negatively affect, um, teachers who are more stressed can negatively affect student achievement, as we know. Um, so, and like I said, this is all pre-pandemic and now even, even much, much more so. So self-care strategies, let's talk about some of these. You can't pour from an empty cup, right? You can't give what you don't have. And that's why we're also so excited about SEL for adults, because we know that teachers can't teach SEL if they don't have SEL. Um, and we can't expect them to have SEL unless we're offering them opportunities to teach it and to practice and get better. So, um, but so I wanted to share with you now this video, and this is from, um, they did a quick video of all the 2020 teachers of the year on self-care. What are some of the ways that you practice self-care? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That's definitely a skill I need to get better at. <laughs> Self-care is hard, especially in this profession. However, my focus has been to get outside more, do more engagement with our environment. I'm cranking up the tunes in the kitchen, I'm cooking something delicious for my family. There is more to life than just work, even if you really enjoy your career a lot, like we do. I don't grade papers at home, I don't check my email very much at home, and uh, I'm a better teacher when I have established healthy boundaries with work and leave work at work. So one of the ways that I practice self-care is being able to say no. Sometimes you have to be able to take a step back and refresh before going on to that next project. One minute meditations, I just close my eyes, take a deep breath, and try not to think too much about what happens. And when I open my eyes, I feel much better. Try to turn your brain off um, and let it be quiet sometimes. Disconnecting from technology and distractions and spending time with the people that I love the most. Before you assist others with the oxygen mask, assist yourself first. I like to exercise and, and be with my family, but yeah, assist yourself before assisting others. I think it's really important to give myself the time to be creative. Even actually really digging in and researching is creative for me. I play the piano in the evenings. I read a book. I try to take time that is both being still and also being active. Spending time in prayer, practicing yoga, or even spending time outdoors, like going boonie stomping um, around the jungles of Guam. Fresh air and um, movement are key to restoring my sanity and perspective. I get up before anybody in my family when it's still dark outside and um, I go to the gym on some mornings or I go uh, just sit and have some quiet time to myself. Or I am going for a walk or I'm reading a book or I'm taking a nap on the weekend. I practice self-care by traveling. Sometimes it's good to get out of our, our bubble. My best mode of self-care is to learn from my students. I've learned patience. I've learned empathy. I've learned the latest dance move. To reach out to other teachers, share experiences, and have somebody to bounce ideas off of, it rejuvenates you and helps you reignite that passion for teaching. Nice. Well, I hope there were some ideas in there that were inspiring to you. And I think, you know, I think a lot of times, too, it's like we all have a long list of ideas for self-care, but I think sometimes it's, it's the implementation of them. But I thought, why don't we all just take a second and everybody type something into the chat box? What, is, what has been, you know, a couple of things or one thing that you're doing um, right now or that you have been doing over the past year for self-care for yourselves? Um, look at that. We have someone started reading for pleasure instead of being on my phone. You know, I've been doing that too. And I've also been trying to read more fiction. 
because I find fiction is more relaxing than reading, um, you know, because I sometimes read more, you know, biographies, exercise, spending morning quiet time praying, playing with my dog. These animals are wonderful for stress, hiking, sleeping, reading novels, meeting up with friends. Um, I know I've been taking bubble baths. I have some lavender bubble bath that I bought, and I've even bought a little bath pillow. That's really nice. Um, gratitude journal, yes. Family dinner with the peak and valley, yeah. That's uh, you know the roses and thorns, peaks and valley. Those are really great ways to talk about feelings. Um, yeah, I know that I've also I have a park near my house, and I've been taking three mile hikes all the time. I also do a lot of mindfulness, like mindful breathing. I think one of the the teachers of the year had said that he takes a mindful breath, and I do that sometimes. I just go into myself and I just breathe. Um, and I meditate. So I don't know. What about you, Jackie? What are some of the things that you do? I love going for walks outside. Amy and I both live in Seattle. So I schedule time on my calendar to go for walks or with my partner. I actually, between the time I sign off from work and that hour, I don't have my phone. I don't talk to anyone. And I really, if I want to go for a walk, if I want to work out, if I want to read a book, that is strictly Jackie time. And that's been the biggest thing that's been helping me out. Um, I know Lynn said she gets pedicures, which I'm right there with you, Lynn. <laughs> um, leaving school at school, Lisa said, and trying to have the nights to herself and her family. Denise said lighting a candle. Um, love that. Hiking in the woods, sleeping. Gratitude journals. These are some really good ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of really good things. Um, and I, well, I saw someone in the chat box had typed that she was having pro problems with the multimedia player and that she hadn't had that in our other webinars. Um, and if other people are having that experience, can you please type that in and let us know as well? I only have one more video to play. It's not anything that we could easily just skip it. So if you were having any issues with the multimedia player, just type that in and we'll just skip the last video because it's not, it's not imperative to our presentation. So um, yeah, I see someone here typing headspace. That's a good one. And um, lots of great ideas. So um, thanks for sharing those. Um, so what's the most stressful part of your job right now? And why don't we think about also just what are some of the ways we could potentially bring in some self-care into that part of our job? So when, you know, when that thing happens, you know, what could we do at that moment? I think that those are good things to think about. Take a breath. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's like... We, we have these if-then plans in second step. So if something happens, then I'm going to do that other thing. And, and we do know from research that that really makes a big difference if you plan in advance. So when we think about anticipating what's going to be stressful, planning in advance, how we're, going to, how we're going to deal with that, and we're more likely to do that thing if we have that planned out. So, um, so managing stress and emotions. Stress is misconceptions about stress and emotions. Stress is bad for you and should be avoided whenever possible. There are good and bad emotions, and it's better to only allow ourselves to feel good ones. Um, having strong emotions is a sign of weakness. Um, so these are some misconceptions about, about stress. So we know that stress is actually not bad for you. In fact, stress is actually good for you. Um, but it's when it becomes too much stress, then that's when it changes into becoming what we call toxic stress, where it can be very damaging and dangerous, and, and basically when the stress becomes too big for us to manage. Um, because when we have stresses that we can overcome and stress that creates, um, you know, energy, that can be a good thing. You know, anger is an, is an emotion that can help us navigate our lives better. It, it, it keeps us safe. Um, that's the case with many, many, many emotions that feel negative, you know, can really push us to do things in our lives that need to be done. Um, and also the, the ability to overcome stress, you know, we call that self-efficacy or collective efficacy if it's as a group. It's that feeling of like, you know, we got this, we can handle this. That can make us feel good about ourselves and competent and resilient. Um, resiliency is wired into who we are as humans um, and also is caring about each other. That's another thing, um, is, is also wired into who we are. So good and bad emotions? No, that's not the case. And any of you that teach Second Step know that that's not the case. And Second Step too, you know, we always teach kids there's no bad feelings. It's just how we respond to them. All, all feelings are good, are, are okay. We have all feelings. Um, and, and it's just a matter of managing the ones that maybe potentially can cause harm to our lives, such as frustration and anger and just creating skills that we need to overcome them in positive ways. So having strong emotions is a sign of weakness. Um, 
I think all of us on here today probably realize that that is not the case, that in fact that is really normal, and sometimes life is really, really hard. I mean, I think we've all been in places in our lives where we really think life is it is too much, that we're like, this is too much, you know? And that's when we need to often call in some of the people who care about us or seek medical attention or, or you know, do whatever, you know, take a, take a wellness day from work. That, that happens. So, um, so one of the strategies that we know is about naming feelings. And I think if you're a kindergarten teacher teaching second step, you know we do this in second step. We do it all the way through. Um, it's about naming our feelings. So how can you handle charged situations without becoming too overwhelmed? When a stressful event occurs, we can weaken our physiological response by simply naming the emotion we feel. And this is based on science. That if I'm in a moment and I just say to myself, okay, Amy, you're just feeling angry. If that's all I do, even that is an intervention. Even that actually lessens my physiological response. Um, a physiological response could be things like muscles tensioning, jaw clenching, feeling hot with anger, all the stuff we teach in second steps. So name entertainment makes a big difference. And I think self-talk makes a big difference. Like I do a lot of self-talk where I'm like, I'm, I'm you know, I kind of call it self-coaching where I'm sort of like, okay, Amy, you've got this, you know, here's what you need to do. This is hard and you can do it. Um, but I do think that feeling of like, okay, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling overwhelmed pause, and then I think I can think more clearly about um, a response. So imagine you're in a staff meeting and it's going longer than anticipated. It's 4.30 and your principal asks everyone to stay an extra 20 minutes to wrap up. The agenda items don't seem very important to you and you think they could easily be covered at another time. You've been working since 7.30 this morning and you have more work to do this evening to prep for tomorrow. How are you feeling? Probably frustrated. You know, so if in that moment you have those feelings and you just say to yourself, I'm feeling frustrated. Research shows that that can make a big difference. Just the act of saying, okay, I'm feeling frustrated. Even if that's all you do, it makes a difference. Um, but likely, once you pause and say, okay, I'm feeling frustrated, then you can likely follow that with some other self-talk than say, okay, life isn't perfect. You know, it's not the end of the world. 20 minutes isn't that big of a deal. Um, you know, my principal, my principal did a big favor for me last week to help me out with something. I can stay an extra 20 minutes for her, you know, just those kinds of things like self-talk. Um, but I think that can make a big difference. So, um, putting emotions into words can help reduce feelings of distress and the physiological response we have to emotional stimuli. When we verbalize our emotions, it activates different parts of our brains rather than just the feeling of these emotions. This is a, as a wheel. I know you cannot see it because it's tiny, tiny little words. Hopefully you have your reading glasses on. Um, but this is something that we use in our SEL for adults program that is a, a feelings wheel that has all the kinds of feelings. And I think also too, that being able to really dig into what that specific feeling is rather than I feel terrible. Like, you know, and also I think too, to, to look at the positive feelings, like how could you, you know, if you're feeling confused, you know, what might you do to change that to feeling hopeful? Usually some, just a few um, bits of self-talk can change you from feeling hopeful. So maybe you don't feel like this situation's great, but maybe you can move it over to this feels hopeful that it could get better or that maybe next time something will be different or that next time I'll react differently. Um, yeah, so I think that that's something to, to, to incur. And I, and I know that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know you're a, you, you all have a very high EQ or you wouldn't be here and you're probably all teaching second step and you're SEL people. Um, but it's just some, of, I think it's always good reminders to hear, you know, these things again and again. So, um, so sleep. I like this little saying, a good laugh and a long sleep is the best cure for anything. And isn't that the truth of it? Really? I have just been so shocked in my life sometimes when I am so stressed and tired and I feel like everything is crumbling down upon me. And then I just get one really, really good night's sleep and I wake up the next morning and I feel like a different person, you know, like, I mean, it's just, is amazing what good quality sleep you can do. And if you have good quality sleep for three, four nights in a row, it's like you can turn the most stressful situation around. And I think that that's also part of the problem is, is when we are really in bad situations in life, when we really have a lot of stress on our plates, we sleep badly. And then that spirals into a worse situation. Um, and so I think that that's why we also wanted to share with you some strategies for improving your sleep because 
in those times of high stress, you tend to sleep badly, and you also tend to make lifestyle choices that increase, that, that actually make the sleep worse. Um, when perhaps when we're in really stressful situations, if we did things to make the sleep better, then that could also help us get out of that emotional place sooner. So, so research studies have shown that sleep deprivation has a significant effect on mood. What's the recommended amount of sleep an adult should get per night? Type in the chat box. What do you think? What is the recommended amount of sleep adults should get per night? At least six hours, six to eight hours, seven to nine hours. Um, and I just read a fantastic book, by the way, called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. I'm going to type into the chat box, actually, because if you are a person who struggles with sleep, um, this is a great book. A lot of folks in here are saying B, six to eight hours. Six to eight hours. Great. Um, and seven to nine hours is the right answer. So um, it's more than what we think. And I hear all kinds of people saying, oh, gosh, I'm... I only need five hours. Like, I don't believe it. You know, you don't believe it. You can get by with five hours. You can get by with a lot of things. You can get by with never doing any exercise and eating just Pop-Tarts. You can get by, you know, but that's not the optimal occasion. So seven to nine hours. This is based on what the doctors say. Um, so lack of quality sleep not only affects our moods, but is also related to negative health outcomes, such as memory loss, a weakened immune system, and increase in junk food cravings. Lack of quality sleep is also related to life-threatening conditions such as heart disease, obesity, dementia, diabetes, and cancer. What percentage of adults in the U.S. are sleep-deprived? 20%, 33%, 52%. Type in your answers in the chat box, please. So what percentage of adults in the U.S. are sleep-deprived? What do you think? A, 20%. B, 33%. C, 52%. I think that this one is so interesting about increasing junk food cravings. I just cannot believe how much I notice that, how much more I want sugar when I'm tired. And I think it's because when you're so tired, you just want caffeine and sugar, like really so badly. Like I just cannot keep my hand out of the M&M jar when I'm, um, (laughs) when I'm really tired and I just want coffee after coffee too. You know, you just, I think when you lack energy, you go for those sources of energy instead. So and the answer is 33% um, B. So that's a you know lot of people. That, what you mean? What's funny is that everyone undershot how much sleep and then everyone overshot. I think the, at least 95% of the people wrote 52%. Oh, really interesting. So mm-hmm. I'm curious. But, you know, and you know what else I think is also to note, too, is all of these things apply to your kids, too. You know, the kids in your classroom are also – Especially if you're a high school teacher, I would say many of you have really sleep deprived kids because they're staying up and they're text messaging till all hours of the night and, and little kids as well too. But I think, um, you know, all the things that affect you affect your ability to teach. Um, and when kids are not sleeping well, um, so, you know, maybe you have, maybe you could encourage your kids and give them some motivation for some good quality sleep too. So. Exposure to blue light, the light emitted by many electronic devices can interfere with sleep. It's a pity, isn't it? But it is true. Um, So how many hours before bedtime should you avoid blue light? A, type them in the chat box. One to two hours. B, two to three hours. C, three to four hours. How many hours before bedtime should you avoid blue light? And for those of you that, that read with a Kindle, I'll give you this little side research project I did. Because after I saw this research, I thought, gosh, I read with a Kindle every night for like an hour. And I did look it up. And from what I read that it's not that bad. The Kindle is not really considered like blue light. It's a different light. Um, But if you read off like a tablet though, that is. But I also think that there are blue light glasses that I've seen. I've not tried those, but those apparently um, could make a difference as well. I have them on right now, actually, Amy. When when we started going work from home um, and we were just so much on the screens, I started getting these like tension headaches and real, a lot of pressure behind my eyes. And I got these, um, they have my prescription in it, but they have ones on Amazon for 10, 20 bucks I never seen that and yet. they've helped so tremendously. That's good mm-hmm. advice. I, 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 um, yeah. So you really noticed a difference. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's two to three mm-hmm. hours. That's a long time. I know. Can you imagine like turning off your phone at like seven o'clock, but that's what the doctors are telling you to do. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and I think it also is a matter of the amount of exposure too. So if you just check a text message once at nine thirty, that's probably not going to make much of a difference. 
you know, but if you're there and you're playing a video game or you're really like, you know, involved in something that's quite a lot, I think, um, I think the moral of the story is here is you should pick up a book or play a board game or, um, you know, I don't think TV counts in this. I don't think TV is, um, cause I think the screen's farther away and it, I, I don't, at least I haven't heard that to be the case. And you, you know what? I mean, I have an iPhone, so I don't know about Androids or any other phones, but you can put on like a blue light filter. So I have it at 7 p.m. My phone does this automatically kind of does this weird tint. Um, and you don't even notice, but it gets it, it gets your eyes ready for bed. So I have that come on automatically every night. Oh, that's great advice. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah. Um, so let's see, what's one thing you're trying to do to help improve your sleep ha- habits? Type them into the chat box. Uh, I'd love to hear what you're doing. Um, I'll share a couple of mine. So one of the things I really try to do is I really try to limit my caffeine intake, which is um, a real pity because I love caffeine. I can drink coffee. <laughs> I can drink it sun up to sundown, but you know what? It's not good for sleep. So I really try to cut it off at the latest at like noon or one. Um, I don't drink a lot of alcohol and I think I, that and part of that is because it really affects my sleep. So if I have two glasses of wine, I notice that it, it affects my sleep. Also a pity because I, I do love wine, but, um, it's something that does affect my sleep. And I try, and I don't sleep with, my, I don't bring my phone to bed with me. I leave my phone, um, in my kitchen plugged in overnight. And so that takes away the temptation for me to be checking my phone while I'm reading and other peaceful things. So um, so yeah, do we have anything coming up in the chat box of no, Yeah, look, a lot of good ideas. Oh, I love that. Listen to rain and thunderstorms on YouTube. That's that's a that's a nice thing. Turn off the TV. Yes, reading instead of scrolling through social media. Oh, a warm shower. I love that. A bath is great. Um, make a bedtime. No light. Room is dark. Um, warm bath. CBD oil. That's interesting. Um, stretching. Yes. Yoga. I'm a, I'm a yoga person myself. So, um, yes, lots of good ideas. Do you have anything else, Jackie, anything that you do that that didn't come up here or anything to share? Yeah. So actually I got this from a wellness webinar that we did with our all staff. And what I do is I get into bed and I usually check my calendar for work the next day tomorrow to like prep myself. Like, okay, am I ready for all those things? And they said that there's significant research behind that too, that even that and bringing work into somewhere, so sacred as your bedroom where you just sleep and rest um, is wrong. So I don't even check once, once I walk into my bed for night, I don't check anything that has to do with work. Even if it's like a casual, just email that turns your brain to be more alert instead of more relaxed. Well, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I actually took Facebook off my phone for that too, just for that check. It's less to check. So I know I just have it on my computer, but I do have, I do check for meetings every night before I go to bed. So maybe I'll try to discipline myself to do that. So, um, so we know just like everything planning ahead makes a difference. So if you want to improve your sleep habits, try making a plan. So come up with, um, pick one thing you'll commit to, to trying this week to improve your overall sleep habits. And then, um, I think that's anything with life. When you try something, try it for two weeks. And if it doesn't work, well then move on to something else. But I think, you know, to give something a good two weeks, I think is how you can, see if it works. So at the end of one week, assess how it went and decide if you want to try building additional habits. But um, yeah, I think perfect sleep is just lovely. You know, you wake up when you've had one of those nights where you've had nine hours of just perfect sleep and you're just like, oh, it's just amazing. So um, let's all be inspired to try to do more of that in our lives and inspire the same and the people we, we share homes with. Foods and moods. I totally regret eating healthy today said no one ever, right? (laughs) None of you have ever thought that. None of you have ever thought that. And I know all of you have thought the opposite. You know, it's like we've all had so many of those like, oh, God, what have I done? (laughs) You know, I've been at a barbecue all day and I've eaten like every single chip in the bowl. And I've, you know, we've all done it. Um, And we're human. And our next segment after this is on self-compassion. So I think that relates as well. But, um, but It's widely known that maintaining a healthy, nutritious diet is a key factor in promoting physical health and well-being. What's less known is the impact of nutrition on our mental health. Um, So are there any foods you've noticed affect your moods? Um, Love to hear that. Type in the the chat box if you have foods that affect your moods. Um, Deborah Wall, researcher and nutrition expert, claims that healthy food choices are happy food choices. Her work, along with that of other researchers, shows that making healthy food choices not only supports physical health, 
but can also help increase levels of happiness and well-being. What you eat is what you feel. Vegetables are more effective at producing in-the-moment happiness than high-fat, high-sugar foods. I'm going to go back to that because I know you don't believe that. Skipping meals affects how we behave and feel. Um, so what you eat is what you feel. And that actually is, is really the case. And I think the next one was so shocking to me. Vegetables are more effective at producing in-the-moment happiness than high-fat, high-sugar foods. I was like, no way. You think you're sitting there with a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream? How can eating broccoli make you feel better than that? But research shows that that's actually the case, and I, I, I can't imagine why. The only theory I have in terms of why that is is because maybe you just feel proud of yourself and you feel good about yourself when you're making good food choices that, you know, that when you're, you know, when you're, you've decided to, you know, to pass on that third piece of pizza and instead have a, have a second helping of salad, maybe you just feel good about yourself and you're proud of that decision um, in the moment. But, but we know that it, it certainly affects um, how we feel. I personally notice the big difference when I eat a lot of bread and sugar. Um, I really crash after that. And it's unfortunate because I love bread and sugar. Um, so that's a sad reality. But um, if you want to try to improve your nutritional habits, try making one change at a time. I know we all wake up on New Year's, New Year's Day or other days when we decide that as of tomorrow, my whole life's going to be different and all my bad habits are gone and I'm a whole new person. Um, but research shows that it's better to do it a little more incrementally. Um, so maybe switching to fruit rather than candy, you know, those kinds of things. So is there a healthier habit that you would like to try? Can you commit to trying this habit for a couple of, um, couple of weeks? So, Write it down. Why don't we write it down now in the chat box? What is one food habit that you are trying to make um, that you would like to try? And I know we probably all know them, but why don't we inspire each other and type in the chat box some healthy food um, choices? Yes, I see gluten carbs make me lethargic. Me too. So my... um. Yeah, I think for me it's sugar. I would have to say sugar is something that I really, um, I just realized how much sugar I eat. And being out of the being out of the office and working from home has also really made me realize how much sugar I eat at work. When I go back to the office, it just, there's candy everywhere, cookies in the kitchen. I'm sure it's the same in your staff staff meeting rooms and things like that. There's always cookies and candies when you're at at, at the at the office. And if you have kids, you know, teenagers especially, probably you've got all kinds of temptation around you. So, but for me, I'm going to say sugar. What what are what are some of the other things we're hearing, Jackie? What, what's the, so the sugar, word? carbs, caffeine? Um, Sarah shared that she food preps, which I love, and I love doing because sometimes, especially when you're running in between meetings or in classes. You don't have time to go and like cut your cucumbers and your carrots and measure out your hummus and get all that jazz. So I find that when I food prep, it takes the thought out of everything. I just know and it's there for me. And um, that's really been helping me too. Um, a lot of people are saying choosing drinking more water over sweet drinks or soda, um, eating more vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it can be hard though. We're all surrounded by temptation. So I think that's where self-compassion comes in, right? You do the best you can. And, um, yeah, I think food prep really makes a difference though. If you have cut up carrots in your fridge, you know, you're much more likely to eat them than if you have to go and cut them up, you know, at the moment. So physical activity, continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. Um, and I think that this is also the case of thinking like, oh, as of tomorrow morning, I'm going to start running every morning before work, you know, probably we can't go to zero to 60 all in one fell swoop when it comes to exercise. So um, it's probably more incremental. It's more likely to be success. We all know physical activities is important to our bodies, but did you know it's also critical for cognitive functioning and mental well-being? Small changes to your physical health routines can have a positive effect on your emotional well-being. So that is certainly the case. I notice a huge difference in terms of how my emotionals, I mean, I can't even, I almost can't even tell you how much I notice that difference. Um, you know, when I do, and, and for me walking outdoors, like if I walk outdoors, especially in nature, I mean, I just literally feel like a different person after an hour of that. So um, it improves your mood for sure, increases your brain power, increases your energy, improves your sleep, 
reduces stress. There's just basically nothing that is not good about exercise. And I also think the other thing is, too, is when you combine exercise with social interactions, you know, there's bunches of research on on how positive social connections really make a difference in our lives. And I think for me, when I meet a friend for a walk, like that is everything. So I'm getting fresh air, I'm getting exercise, I'm talking, you know, I'm connecting, I'm sharing with someone. And also it makes the walk go by quicker. Like you can, you can walk for twice as long with a friend and, and not feel like you're looking at your watch or, you know, I don't know. Um, so why don't people share in the chat box, what is, what is one thing that you do that helps you to motivate to exercise um, or some type of exercise you like doing? But I think specifically most of us struggle with the motivation when you're tired and you're run down and you're busy and your kids are yelling and you've got a lot of stuff to do. How do you get yourself to exercise when you're in that point? Jackie, what, what about you? So I know I schedule it just like I'll schedule. If I tell a friend I'm going to meet them for dinner, I stick to that and I meet them for dinner. So I do the same thing with exercise and movement and just really listening to my body. Do I want to go on a walk or a hike? Um, someone shared that they want to go on bike rides with their sons after work. Um, anything that I, is it yoga? Is it stretching? Is, whatever it is and what my body needs that day, because some days you're just so tired and you don't want to hop on the Peloton or do a YouTube video or whatever you're doing, but you can go for a walk for 10, 20 minutes and still get a lot of the benefit. Yeah. I mean, I do almost no like really hard cardio activity because I just can't motivate myself to do it. Like I'm not getting on that Peloton. I'm not going to spinning. I'm not going to do any kind of like really high, you know, I'm not signing up for CrossFit, like none of that, but I can go on a walk and I do a lot of it. Um, and it makes, and then walk to Starbucks, right. So, or if you're going to meet a friend for a drink, walk beforehand, you know, like Mm -hmm. someone had typed in there about their Fitbit too. And I find those trackers make a huge difference to me. Like I use my, um, on my iPhone, it has a step counter in there. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of like, I think if you have an iWatch, I don't, but I think that those track your steps or, um, you know, I think even them, some things like Weight Watchers or Noom or some of those different like things that you use to track, at least for me, they kind of can gamify it a bit and it can make it fun. And I get kind of competitive with myself, um, to want to know that I've done it, you know, 10 days in a row or whatever, like it makes a big difference. So, um. I love what Melanie said. Melanie said she just needs to dance for fun once a week. Just put some music on and dance. Wouldn't the world be better if we all did more dancing, right? That's what we all need. (laughs) Dancing, friends, fun. Um, So it's surprising how small changes in activity can yield big benefits. Adding 10 minutes of light exercise to your daily routine can be beneficial for both physical and mental health. I also find, too, that having... 10 minutes sometimes can lead to 20 minutes. You know what I'm saying? You say to yourself, okay, I'm just going to walk around the block. I'm just going to walk around the block. And then once you get out there, you're like, oh, I could go a little longer. Um, The other thing that I do is I actually ask, when when I'm self-talking about exercise, rather than saying, Amy, you need to exercise. Amy, you need to go on a walk. I, I ask it as a question. I say, could I go on a walk? Could I get myself to do that? What do you think? And then I think, yeah, I can do that. Like, you know, like, so it's not so like I'm not giving myself this directive. that's like you must work mm-hmm. out or you must exercise. It's more like, gosh, you know what? I've got three hours until I need to do this thing. And, you know, could I go, on, could I go on the, around the block at lunch today or whatever? So I do the know? same thing. I reframe it. I have to go for a walk to I get to go for a walk. My body lets me move and you should feel grateful for that. And also I'm thankful, you know, to thankful that I can, because not, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, there's times in life that we all don't have the health where we aren't able to do that. And I think that's a, that can also be a gratitude practice. So, but I think after we talk about food and exercise, why don't we talk about self-compassion? Because I know none of us are perfectionists on the, on the call here today. Um, Having compassion for yourself means that you honor and accept your humanness. Even if that means you eat more cupcakes than you wish, or you haven't exercised in a month, like you're okay anyway. Um, so researchers define compassion as the feeling that arises when you are confronted with another's suffering and feel motivated to read that, to relieve that suffering. Self-compassion is when we can turn this feeling inward towards our own suffering. Life is really hard. I mean, the reality is it is hard, hard, hard. And there's sometimes it's extra hard. Um, and during those times, you know, and teaching is extra hard often, you know, and so we all try our best and, you know, and your best is good enough. And, and I think that, that sometimes you have to tell yourself that. And especially for those of you that are teachers and moms or dads, you know, I think parents always feel like I'm not a parent, but, um, 
they always feel like they're not doing enough, that they're not doing a good enough job or that, you know, and, and people feel that way with their, their, their aging parents and other things too. And, you know, really you're just doing your best. And um, all we can do is just try to do a little better than we did yesterday. You know, that's all we're trying to do in life is we're not trying to compare ourselves to the, the images we see of people that we know from high school on Facebook who seem to have everything perfect. You know, it's probably fake anyway, but anyway, we're not comparing ourselves to those people. We're comparing ourselves to, to who we were yesterday and thinking, you know, could I do a little better today? And that is enough. Um, so in her book, Willpower Instincts, psychologist Kelly McDonald McGonagall describes its benefits, self-compassion, being supportive and kind to yourself, especially in the face of stress and failure, is associated with more motivation and better self-control. Um, rather than berating ourselves for our failures, let's, you know, let's really have compassion for ourselves and know that we really are doing the best we can. We really, really are. And and thankfully, there are some days we can we can do better and there's some days we can't. And so we just take us take ourselves where we are and um and offer that to our to our coworkers and to our friends and family too. So, showing yourself kindness is more effective than being hard on yourself too, and you're better able to cope with difficult experiences. So, um, you're better you're able to provide more emotional support to students also when you're not being really hard on yourselves, and you're also likely to stay in the profession longer because because really teaching is hard, you know, and you have so much pressure. I mean, it's, it just can be ridiculous sometimes the amount that we're asking of our teachers in this country. And I think that all of you can take a pass sometimes and say, you know what, what is your personal permission slip today? Write yourself a permissional permission slip that says, you know what, for today, I am not going to do X, Y, and Z. You know, you can do that too. Like you don't need to be perfect. You really don't need to. Your best is good enough. So, um, so let's talk about gratitude. Be present in all things and be thankful for all things. The beautiful Maya Angelou um, said this, and I think it's really true because I think that gratitude is often the best way through any problem that we can have in our life is to be thankful for what we have. And I also think the more thankful for what we have, the more good things seem to come to us because we notice the good things, you know? So it's like there's so many good things in our lives um, and I just think the more we notice them, the happier we feel. Um, so you're not alone if you find yourself dwelling on the negative aspects right now. Researchers call this negativity bias. You can disrupt this natural negativity bias and enhance your personal well-being by intentionally paying more attention to what's going well and expressing gratitude for us. So, so we have this thing called negativity bias. It's kind of built in. I think it's like our way that our, our, you know, our brains are looking for problems to keep us safe. That's something that our, our brains are built to do because, because we're looking to, to survive as a species and keep ourselves safe. And so we look for potential harmful things. Um, but we can disrupt that by, by looking for things that are good and looking for the positive and looking for things to be grateful for. So uh, expressing gratitude is a well-researched routine. Expressing gratitude regularly can change our mindset over time. Um, expressing gratitude can be done publicly or privately. Um, so being concrete and specific. So rather than just saying, I'm thankful for my life, to think about, I'm thankful for my daughter. I'm thankful for this home that I live in. I'm thankful for the sun that's shining today. I'm thankful for the new shoes that I just bought. You know, like go into detail instead of making a list. Um, yeah, that's great to go into the depth of why, you, why you're grateful for that specific thing. And focus more on people than things. Um, what are you grateful for today? Um, one of the very exciting things that I am personally very grateful for today is that we are coming out with an SEL for Adults program very soon, next month at Committee for Children. This has been something that you have been asking for for many, many years um, because we know that you can't teach skills that you don't have. And um, SEL for Adults is, is really should be the foundation of doing this work in schools. So it is a research-based digital professional learning program designed to strengthen K-12 educators' social and emotional skills. Modules prioritize educator well-being and build a positive learning environment with new and responsive content to be added over time. So the way it works is it is 15 hours of individual and group learning. You have um, training modules that you would do as a whole school staff, training modules that you would do in small groups like grade level teams, for an example, and then there's micro learnings that you do as individuals. So 
Um, and this is a program that is our first module is on building trust. So this is about forming the community amongst your teachers and building this really great, um, yeah, this sort of sense of belonging and these things, uh, inclusion with your teachers and support. The second module is managing stress, which is where some of the research that I've drawn in our presentation today comes from, and, and much more than that also, but it's um, really giving you the skills that you need to, to manage your own stress. Teaching is incredibly stressful. Um, so, and, and if I, as collectively as a staff, you know, one of the things we, we shared in, in our chat comments was that if we, um, you know, if you partner up with someone to exercise, it's more fun and it's better. And the same thing is if you partner up with your whole teaching staff, that you're all doing these things together, it's better. Um, our third module, advancing equity. So we're going to learn about unconscious bias and learn how as adults we can do things to make our schools more equitably, equitable. Um, developing efficacy. And if you're not familiar with the term efficacy, um, self-efficacy is about kind of developing the feeling of competence. Like I, I can handle it. I can, I can overcome this situation in front of me. I got this. I can do it. Um, collective efficacy is feeling that as a teaching staff so that we feel like, you know what, we got this. We got these kids. We got these goals. We can do all the things um, if, if we join hands and do it together. So um, so we are doing a webinar very shortly on, um, I think that's June 11th. And here's a few parting words. Be the reason someone smiles. Be the reason someone feels loved and believes in the goodness of people. And I'm going to um, read out... Um, so that that webinar is on June 10th. Great. So here's some of the things people are thankful for. My best friend, sunshine, friends and family, health, grandchildren, family, my house and job. There's um, so much to be thankful for. And uh, I'm going to leave us with a video that is part of our Mind Yeti on gratitude. So this is about a five-minute video, and you are welcome to stay for another five minutes and just have a mindful moment focused on gratitude. Um, and for those of you that aren't going to stay for our last, um, it's a four minute video actually on gratitude. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really, um, happy for, for having you here. We hope we've given you a little inspiration on things you can do to take care of yourself. Um, you are all amazing. You're amazing in, in the, in the, in the best of times and in this past year and a half through this pandemic or, um, you have just been absolutely amazing stars for the kids and are, um, yeah, we are we are in a better world because of teachers and kids are, um, you know, you do such good work for your kids and we hope that you do all the same for yourself because you are totally worth it. So um, enjoy this little four minute break on gratitude and hopefully we'll see you back at another webinar soon. Hello. Welcome to Mind Yeti. Gratitude is noticing the good things in your life and saying thank you for those things. Just saying thank you can put you in a better mood. And it can help you settle the hubbub and feel more connected to the world around you. Today, you are going to think about having gratitude. Before we begin, take a moment to find your Yeti body. Sit comfortably with your back straight and your feet or legs resting on the floor. Feel how the floor or your chair supports you as you sit. We call this your Yeti body. Start by taking a few breaths. If you want, you can close your eyes. Now, think about something that brought you happiness this week. Maybe you had your favorite food or heard a song you love or had fun playing with a friend. Maybe a dog wagged his tail when he saw you. Don't worry if you're having trouble thinking of something. It can be something simple, like a joke that made you laugh. 
for a moment, just remember that happy thing. Notice how you feel when you think about it. Now, silently say thank you. Notice how it feels to say thank you. You can feel gratitude for big things and for little things. It's easy to forget the little things that make us feel happy every day. Like feeling the warm sun on your face. Gratitude is just as simple as remembering to notice the special things in your life and saying, thank you. Just think about that for a moment. What do you notice about your mood? Notice if your mood feels a little different. Anytime you want to get in a better mood or settle the hubbub, slow down and try to think of something that makes you happy. Then take a moment to say, thank you. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and return your attention to the room.